The more I hear these sort of debates, the more I become more and more persuaded that we've got to get politicians and bureaucrats out of our education system altogether. I am therefore sympathetic to the direction of travel that Nikki is going in. I'm sympathetic to it. I don't necessarily sign up to all of it, but I'm sympathetic to it. Uh, because I don't really want local education authorities, politicians meddling in it. Uh, the one thing I hope we don't swap out there is to sort of, if we remove the local bureaucracy, I hope that's not replaced by central diktats being issued by the Secretary of State for Education, however charming and well-intentioned she may be. We have got to let teachers teach again. We are having political arguments that lead to endless form-filling, uh, tick boxes, incredibly prescriptive national curriculums about exactly what each pupil needs to learn when. Let's put our faith back in the teaching profession. Let them design the curriculum. Let them work out what happens in the classroom. More power to the teachers, less to the politicians, and we'll have a much better education system in the United right. Kingdom. One more point from you, sir. No, no. Yeah. Point made here, when you came into being Education Secretary in 2014, you said, oh no, two, four, it was September, a Conservative conference, you said you were going to reduce the teachers' workload. Yeah. What happened? We have met, taken steps absolutely to do that. What, what, what about the extra hour, Nikki? Is that going to help teacher recruitment? To keep well, it doesn't, have to, be, it doesn't have to be run by teachers. The whole point about extracurricular activities is that other people can come in Just and oh, run the right. sport. Uh, very briefly, answer this point, I want to go we on have made a, We have absolutely made commitments in terms of, of not introducing changes uh, midway through the year, lightening the Ofsted load. We have more to say there are three working groups looking at the things that teachers most complain about, marking, data collection, lesson planning, and I'll have more to say about that next week. Uh, can I, can I just, can I just raise a point? There are some parts of the country where all the schools, in, a, in an area where you'll have grave concerns about education standards, they are all academies. And you have nothing, you have no answer to how to raise the standards there. If your only way of raising standards, as you say, is, is by turning a school into an academy, you, know, you do not have the answers. Well, and, you and need remember, to read the white paper because that's exactly what I we have, cover in the what? white paper. We, I mean, I'm a bit weird. I have. Gosh. And, and, and what you've got <laughs> is in order to be able to get Get more teachers into the profession. You're setting up a website. You're setting up a website. We have had four years. No, we've had more that, teachers a lot leaving more the profession that. than we've had coming into the profession. You have a crisis in terms of, of, of recruitment and retain, retention of teachers. Yes, you may have more teachers than ever, but you have more pupils than ever. Can we have these. We have these ginormous great schools. Right. We have you know so many children in classes of more than 40, and you're not addressing that. We it have. is becoming like Andrew Lansley and the health service all over no. again. All right, not all right, addressing all right, that. Yeah, I'll give you just a Did sentence you know, or two. No, hold on. No. We have a challenge in teacher recruitment, but particularly because there are certain subjects which um, y fewer Maths, people, physics, young, young no, people don't took interrupt each other, please, the or we'll never government. get anywhere. <laughs> Just let each other we have speak. Fewer people took them and studied them to A level and beyond under the last Labour government, and therefore that has led to issues around teacher right, recruitment. We Doctor, are that right. Dr. Catherine Govea, please. Um, I think it may be our last question. Let's have it. Thank you. Um, I'm a junior doctor. My husband works in financial markets. Yet between us, we find it difficult to evaluate the pros and cons of making a voting decision in the EU referendum. Have the public been well prepared to vote in this referendum? Right. When you say I'm a doctor and my husband works in finance, you mean that we ought to understand it? Yes. <laughs> That's saying a lot. Um, Mark Littlewood. The question is an important one. We get it all the time. The pros and cons of the EU referendum, have the public been prepared to vote? Do they know enough? Has enough been said? Is it clear enough? Uh, you all go, far away. By June the 23rd, I'm pretty sure you and your partner will be heartily sick of another 99 days of, of people fighting about the European Union. Look, I think th th this is going to be a major decision that is going to have an impact on the United Kingdom for potentially generations to come. I don't have an issue in which I've... Uh, uh, have a different uh, opinion to my partner. I have a, uh, an issue which I have a different opinion to the one I had 20 years ago. Uh, uh, and I think that you were a federalist. Yeah, I, I, I was a former federalist. keen pro-European. <laughs> I love the idea of a European Union that is liberal, democratic, a brotherhood of man, uh, light touch regulation. 
And if that European Union does exist somewhere in a parallel universe, <coughs> then that's great for that parallel universe. Well, it's uh, but it doesn't it's exist. Reformed, it, it doesn't um, exist Nick here. Nick has already told us. Uh, so you're going to have to, just as you do in a general election, or I think this decision is more important, however, you're going to have to listen to all sides of the debate, and you're going to have to decide who you trust and what in your heart and your head feels right. And I think it is absolutely right and proper that this decision is being batted to you, the electorate, not the politicians on this panel. Well, you this think it was right. Decision. You think it was right to have a referendum. Yes, uh, I, and, and it wasn't just to save the Conservative Party from its divisions. I'm sure it was to uh, save the Conservative Party from its divisions. But uh, even if that was the trigger for it, I'm delighted that we have got it yeah. finally at last. After decades of arguing about mm. it, you, the people, are actually going to decide on the future of our nation. Mm. So and you'll even vote if you, decided, I will vote to leave. You're going to vote um, to leave. All right. Uh, uh, and even if you find it boring and technical and there's mud swinging involved, I just implore you, do your best to try and make the best judgment you can. Right. Because what you do on June the 23rd will yeah. have an impact for a very long time to come. And it's, it's, I, I, it, it's been noticeable, uh, Emily Thornbury, that the Prime Minister and the people around him who want to remain have been vociferous and Labour's been strangely silent about this whole issue. Uh, not speaking out. Why is that? I don't think we're not speaking out. I Never think we're speaking out very... Well, all right. I, you know, well, let's talk a bit louder. What we, Labour is in favour of remaining in the European Union because over, because over and above everything else, we need to make sure that people have jobs. And we need to make sure that we have investment coming into this country. And we believe at a time when there may be cold winds blowing through the, through the economies of the world in the near future, we must stay in the European Union. It is to the advantage of all of us. To answer her question, do you believe the ground has been well prepared? And that's why I asked you the question about Labour. Do you think the issues have been spelt out in a way that somebody with a busy life, a professional life, listening to the arguments, can make up their minds? I think that jobs and investment are you know, two very important reasons. I think that if we were to go off as an island, off into the Atlantic, all by ourselves, I think we would be putting ourselves at risk. I think the world is getting to be a smaller place, and I think we've talked about it tonight. You know, some of these multinational companies do not care about national border, borders anymore. We need to be able to remain within the European Union so that we are big enough to stand up to, to, to these companies. And also there are issues such as climate change, which cannot, which do not recognize national borders. We need to be able to work right. within a bigger union. A bigger union. You, That's why it's, we're safer. I think we're in one of the safer corners of the world and we should keep it that way. Do you think the arguments have been well put? Um, I think the arguments have been very much focused towards the economic side, but what about like the cultural side of things? So I think that we as a nation, in Chelsea in particular, like, I feel like we're very naive about other cultures and surely by leaving the EU, we would become more naive because you wouldn't learn about the other cultures in Europe. All right, and, and at the very back there, do you think that, that we, we are being well prepared for this vote? I don't think we've been very well prepared at all. Um, there's not, I haven't heard purely because I'm 17, I haven't heard much about um, how it's going to impact the next generation at all. All right, and, and, and you, sir, up there on the gangway. I'm a little bit more concerned that the politicians don't know whether we should stay in the EU or, or leave the EU. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned that having a Prime Minister that's so set on staying in the EU when we have the chance to leave it will it create more economic uncertainty if we do vote to leave. All right, Roger, Roger Helmer. Well, what we get is we get people, as in this audience, saying, tell us the facts. Now, what we're looking at is the future, two years, five years ahead. And nobody can be sure what is going to be happening two years or five years ahead. Although we have a pretty clear idea of the sort of trade terms, can't be worse than WTO trade rules, and we will get a free trade deal which will be better. But the question I would put to those who want to stay in, what is the European Union going to look like in five years' time? In five years' time, those million migrants in Germany, if they've stayed in Germany, will, be, will have a right under free movement to come to any other member state, including to Britain. Um, and right as we speak, there is this European Council going on today and tomorrow where they're discussing this absolutely bizarre deal with Turkey, where Turkey takes one person back from Greece in exchange from Greece, taking one, uh, per, one migrant from Turkey, and we're paying six billion euros for the privilege, and we are fast-tracking access, visa-free access to the Schengen area, and we've agreed to fast-track 
Turkish membership, Turkish membership is 75 million Turks. Now, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that 75 million Turks are coming to Britain, but it is quite reasonable to suppose that several million might move to Western Europe in the interests right. of... The, the, the woman there, you in, three in, yes. Um, I think it's amazing how um, unarticulate the politicians are with this. Um, I think if you were to ask people why to stay or why to go, um, you would have better conversations in the pub than you would hear in the House of Commons, and ones which people would understand. Um, I, I work in marketing. I think they're two of the worst campaigns I've seen. I think you should be very clear about um, what we would gain if we stayed and what we would be losing if we left. Those are the two questions we need answering before we can vote. Thank you, David. If we may go back to the lady who asked uh, the initial question, is the ground ball prepared? No, it's not. It certainly isn't yet. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't want to have uh, the referendum so close, because we want to give the people of this country an opportunity to have a national conversation, one which we enjoyed in the Scottish independence referendum, where all of the arguments for and against, and of course there are two sides to every story, are played out so people can make an informed decision based on fact, not based on fear. What we've seen at the moment, however, is men in suits involved in this debate from beginning to end, and there need to be more women involved in this three, debate. Yeah. And I think we'll see, it, we will ch have a changing exactly. face of this debate when this happens, because we need to see and think about mm. what membership of the EU means for women, yeah. what it means for young people, what it means for farmers, what it means for fishermen. All of the yeah. sectors that make up our society should have a say in this right. debate. Hold and we shouldn't try and stifle on. the debate yeah. by saying people are going on, to be bored to by it. This is a matter of great importance. And to the lady who's 17 up the back, I voted for you to have a vote in this referendum. You should most certainly be having one. All right. Yeah, um, Nikki Morgan, can you pick up the point that uh, Tasmina mm. made, that, that this is being done in a rush? Why is it being done in such a rush? No, I don't think it's being uh, done in a, in a rush, but I think we've got time to debate the issues between the end of uh, February or middle of February when the Prime Minister uh, negotiated the deal right through to the 23rd of June. And um, from the lady who uh, talked about the campaigns, I mean, I think this is exactly what we want to see, is the conversations happening. It shouldn't be happening just in Westminster. Briefly. Please, yes, I must come back on, on Emily's point. She's worried about jobs. I'm worried about jobs too. I'm worried about the jobs we've lost in the steel industry and the jobs we've lost with aluminium plant closures and the jobs we've lost in the chemicals industry and the fertilizer industry, all as a direct result of European policies Nonsense. which have driven up Nonsense. energy prices. Right. Look at the facts. We have, to, we have to stop. We've run out of time, way run out of time. I'm so sorry um, to those of you who had your hands up. And um, we'll, we will come back to it, but it won't be in Chelmsford. I know, what to be done. <laughs> Uh, question time is back after Easter on the 7th of April. We're going to be in Ilford. Come to Ilford. Um, with the, with, we have on the panel there the novelist, the author of Train Spotting, Irvin Welsh, and the Daily Telegraph columnist, Alison Pearson. I